Hello, brothers and sisters of the Briar. Professor Jeremiah here. On Three Rivers. And Steve, did you know that this is our 10th Pith Helmet matinee? Do you know, I hadn't been counting, but it's amazing where the, where the time has gone, that's for sure. And, and most of them, we've had a good number of viewers, both when we released this uh, as a live feed, mm. as well as people following up. Can you believe people are watching this thing? <laughs> well, I have not, well, I have appreciated the comments and they've all been very, very positive. So thank you everybody for that. So I will say right off the bat, in case you don't watch much further than this, do do give us a thumbs up to let us know you're out there watching this and enjoying it. Now, leave us a little feedback in the comment section down below. Uh, and if you have questions for us, uh, definitely uh, ask away. We we may or we may not answer those questions, depending on how personal they are. We'll, we'll give the personal <laughs> questions to Steve, and I'll handle oh, these. Yeah. <laughs> But don't mention German aircraft. <laughs> well, uh, I will say we have our mystery guest today, and so this will be our third mystery guest. So uh, mm -hmm. I've been looking forward to, to this interview. It's already pre-recorded, so you, mm -hmm. you will see a sudden change of clothes, uh, which we're wearing. But I, I looked up and I'm smoking the same pipe that I was in the interview. So uh, I've got my Northern Briar pipe right here and uh i've got a little bit of uh norman rockwell portrait uh which was a blend that i had stored up but steve had mentioned uh having a little chocolate flavor in that so i had pulled it out and that, that's all i smoke in this pipe is chocolate flavored but I, i'll say i don't get the chocolate throughout the bowl i, I get it just at various times in this smoke well, I, I tend to get it at the beginning, but I only uh, was able to have that tobacco by the kind uh, kindness of uh, the gentleman's scholar, Gaz. He, he sent it me. So, okay. uh, yeah, I'd never heard of it before, but uh, I believe they do several blends. And I'm on the uh, Garrett and Hoggers uh, Best Brown Number 2, uh, Burley in Virginia, and uh, I'm no longer smoking my Northern Briars poker. I'm smoking my one of my Peterson's Donegal Rocky with the silver band. So right. I believe there's a new range of these out, still called the same, but they're a little bit chunkier these days, apparently. Let's uh, let's see what the commander's adventure is today, and where he is in the world. El Mesa Mucho, the home of the giant bird. Oh, did I ever tell you about the time I was held captive? No, Commander, but I really must be going. I must be going too. I'll tell you on the way. I'd been flying over desert country when suddenly my engine stopped. Quickly, I bailed out. I landed in a huge bird's nest. My chute covered me so that I looked just like the other eggs. Just then, the mother bird arrived and settled on the nest until we hatched. After the first shock, she treated me as one of her own. When it came time to fly, she pushed Alice, Jeffrey, and Seymour out of the nest. Then it was my turn. Of course, I fell like a stone. Good heavens, Commander. What happened? Oh, Mother caught me. She tried again and again, but finally gave up and left me in the nest. I became her favorite. How did you ever manage to escape? Well, didn't exactly. Can I give you a lift? No, thanks, Commander. I've got to be... I say, Commander. <laughs> Unless you saw it, you wouldn't believe it, would you? <laughs> <laughs> that maybe is the most cartoonish of them all so far, but <laughs> it's still pretty funny. Uh, voice on the Mick Bragg reminds me of a, a character out of Faulty Towers. Uh, the old colonel. I don't know if that's like a worldwide. Uh, I think it is. Most people have seen Faulty Towers, aren't they, with John? Connors? Oh yeah. 
I would think so. I would think many, most people here watching this at least have seen it or know it. Mm. <laughs> the voice still reminds me. Oh, I, I, I need to maybe put up a couple of clips of this character, but you had, uh, I guess, uh, introduced me to the world of Sir Guy Wallace. And so oh. maybe that's another real life Commander McBrag, right? Well, he is larger than life, Sir Guy. And he, he is what he is. That was his breed. And um, yeah, there was this uh, program that was recorded. Oh, the, the presenter, the producer was all this one guy. And he's anti-blood sports, he's a vegan. And the guy is all, all but those things. Plus he smokes a pipe. And uh, it was, I'm not sure how old he was. Uh, how, he was late on in his years. But he was going to have one last game hunt in Africa. And I think it'd be the water buffalo, which can be rather nasty, can't they? Oh, yeah. But, uh, he would, you know... It, as a sportsman, he he was well prepared. You know, he, his his gun was true, his aim was true, and it was all leading up to this in his lifestyle. So this chap who was presenting it and filming it, it was a more or less tongue in cheek, a little bit, you know, almost setting him up for things. But I, I think Sir Guy came through it very well indeed. So you've had a few, of, you've seen a few of those, have you now? I, yeah, I have. I I've watched as much as I could, but I couldn't find the documentary anywhere. And no. I was kind of surprised. I, I don't know if they pulled it or what. I really don't know. Uh, but the trailer, which showed you like snippets going through and ending up with him stood on the stairs with the, the horns of a water buffalo, that's the story in a capsule. And um, even where he's cooking his breakfast, <laughs> which you probably saw in a... A frying pan had two inches of bacon and sausage fat on it, and he's just throwing the meat in, and then ate straight out of there, and then actually fed his dog with some as well. <laughs> but yeah, have you seen the complete documentary? No, I, I think um, the, another gentleman we know very well. He he knows of it, but he's never seen the full. Uh, so I don't like to say they could have pulled it. Yeah, uh, well, when I well, looked on BBC's site, I believe the last time it aired may have been 2018 was the mm -hmm. last time that it showed that it had aired, and, and I couldn't uh, find it anywhere. I, I really couldn't believe that. So, Well, the thing is, he is what he is, but the presenter was trying to get a rise out of him. He, wasn't, he was trying to portray him in another light, and although the guy kept coming through it, um, he, he was a bit naughty, I thought. But I thought, well done for Sagai. He stuck with his guns. That's it. I think he even interviewed him when he's going to bed. What happens if this buffalo kills you tomorrow? And he had a great answer for it, didn't he? Oh, he yeah. did. Yeah. What a way to go, rather than stinking in a old people's home. Yeah, well, that was his words. You know, old people's home, no disrespect, because uh, there's some extremely very well run. Every time. Yeah, he said, I think it was like that that'd be better than sitting in the waiting room of the NHS. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, this is all before our present challenge, isn't it? So, oh, yeah, for sure. And and you don't know what became a Sir Guy, do you? Well, you could go on Wikipedia and it will tell you when he was born. And if there's no other date after that, he's still with us. <laughs> well, it's the second date, then uh, well, he's a strong old boy. You know, it was made oh, of yeah. Yeah. stuff. Yeah, I mean, it highlighted that he would go out walking every, you know, every day and would walk miles and miles and keep yeah. walking. Not afraid of hard work, uh, but he enjoyed his pipe particularly much. And um, indeed, and he also enjoyed his snuff. And he did tell that story about the lion chasing <laughs> off the tree. <laughs> I'll leave that one for people to look up. Yeah. <laughs> Sir God's <laughs> lion story. <laughs> yeah. Suffice to say that the lion couldn't catch him, couldn't climb the tree because he kept slipping on something. Well, there we go. <laughs> Fill in the blanks. Yeah. Well, I have another advert for us, and I will say 
right off the bat of all the tobacco commercials out there, this has always been my favorite one. And right. and not to say it could be replaced one day, but uh, this, is, this has been the most favorite that I've ever run across, partly because it's the most quoted tobacco commercial. Uh, you know, this is a predicament we all could find ourselves in. Davenport, isn't it? Up for membership. Yes, that's right. You know, your father, he was a pipe man. Very generous chap, as I recall. Oh, I'm sorry. Would you care to... Gold block, eh? <laughs> My word. Do you think there'll be any problem with my membership? None at all at this rate, old chap. None at all. Eh? Gold block. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> so, so uh, I, I guess you've seen that commercial before, haven't you? Oh, years ago. Years ago. But the guy, the c commander, whatever his name was, that was the colonel in Faulty Towers. Yeah, and, and I thought his his voice sounded like McBrag, but I hope he got his membership after all that. Well, the only chap I ever knew that had a pipe that big was uh, I've mentioned in one of my videos of my channel, the Wing Commander, uh, which was Charles Edward Michael Penn Lewis, and that was huge. It was a, a dustbin on a stalk. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then he takes a tobacco pouch to, to, to boot. <laughs> so is, is uh, Gold Block, is that a tobacco you're familiar with? I've never heard of it. I before. have smoked it. I can't remember what it was like, but I never went back to it. So uh, I guess would you want to give a little introduction to our mystery guest for today? Our mystery guest. It is a gentleman. Um, he's going to be our first English uh, representative of the ambassador of the YTPC. Um, I've known him only a couple of years and initially through YouTube and I've met him on a couple of get togethers. Um, he's one of very few people I know who has that palate that can not just detect the, um, the tobacco leaves in, in a blend but the strengths within that blend. And what I admire about him more than anything is that I seem to have the same taste in tobacco as he does. So anything he recommends, it's usually on my next list, as is this um, Best Brown number two here. So um, uh, yes, that, that's come from this gentleman. So very well respected in his community, our community and his, his own community. And uh, again, one of those gentlemen hides his light under a bushel. So looking forward to you revealing him, Professor. Yeah, well, I, like you, I've gotten to know him uh, a little bit, maybe not as well as you do, but uh, a little bit over the last year for certain. And the Zoom meetups have really helped with that. Uh, a, a number of us were talking about that last evening as we had a Zoom meetup that, uh, you know, it's, it's really allowed us to all kind of come out from behind the camera in a sense to be able to talk with one another. And so our next guest is one that uh, I've really gotten to know through the zoom meetups and you can almost always find him on a Friday. He posts a video on Fridays and oftentimes they'll have a tobacco review for us on a Saturday. So without a further. Oh, professor, I, I don't know if you'll allow me before we go into it and you might appreciate at least one of these things is that on this day that we were talking with our guest, the 21st of April, there's one or two instances in history that has happened. In fact, on this very day is our own Queen Elizabeth II birthday, her, her 94th birthday. So happy birthday to you, Your Majesty. And also, um, going back to 753 BC was the founding of ancient Rome. So there we go. I feel much better for that. And then there's one for, yeah, exactly. And there's one for Doc Hatfield here, Doc. 1956, Elvis Presley's first hit record, Heartbreak Hotel, becomes number one. I love to think it was on the backing group. 
<laughs> well, let's uh, let's start our interview. As as we said earlier, this was a pre-recorded interview, and so uh, here's our visit with Uncle Phil. Uncle oh. Phil, welcome. <laughs> Good evening, gentlemen. Hello, Phil. Thanks for joining us. Um, You're more than welcome. Well, we use the um, everything going well in the uh, the cellar towers. <laughs> We're a bit cooped up here. <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine. We're all in that boat at the moment. Uh, but uh, you're working from home at the moment as well, aren't you? So it's, yeah, I'm lucky. My phone, we're all working. Nobody's been furloughed, so. Oh, well, that's brilliant, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, sort of start proceedings with um, just half a dozen uh, innocuous questions, I hope, Phil, uh, okay. if you don't mind me asking those. And I'll, I'll, if you're all right, I'll start with the, the first one. It's just to get warmed up, if you like. Um, what is your most favourite blend of tobacco? And I, I don't mean as in a brand, but the constituents of, of your tobacco, your, your favourite one, may I ask? <sighs> you say, yeah, I think I like um, Burley tobaccos mostly. Burley's with Virginia or Burley's with Kentucky. So it could be Lakeland or it could be plain burley virginia but that that those are the two i mostly smoke i could have had a bit of a guess and got that one from following your series oh yes but based on that and um, in what form and what brand would you then have the opportunity of going into tobacconist and saying right i will have that to represent that blend which one would you choose is there a particular one and you, you stuck with one which one would it be Oh, I would probably have to go with Twist Tobacco, uh, the, the brown twists from Gareth Hogarth or the black twist. Yeah. Which you recently reviewed, haven't you? I reviewed the black twist, yeah, and then I'll do the brown at some point, but they are my secret favourites for sure. It's not a secret anymore. But... No, I was about to say. There's <laughs> <laughs> a song there, I'm sure. Um, Phil, in your area where mm -hmm. you live, and I'm not restricting you to, you know, down the road or five miles, on the sort of outing, and it could be your back porch, is where would you recommend or enjoy that you go to to relax and just take in the air and maybe even take Mrs. Sellers? Well, I'm not far from Oxford, so yeah. that's got to be an outing for anybody it's coming to my area so i'm a 35 minute drive from there and you've got you know you've got a thousand years of history in those buildings all those old colleges libraries museums the pub you're sat in right now i know but you say it gets full of uh, hobbit lovers which always conjures up a very bad image <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy! <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you've been since, in here, haven't you, Phil? Since the film, before the films came out, you would always get the odd two or three people going to the pub and wanting to see where C.S. Lewis and Tolkien met and the Inklings and all that. But after the films came out, you can't get in the place anymore. Oh well, so one hundred percent of a tourist trap now. Oh well, well that that's not it on the head out. I think I mentioned to you about potential coming down uh, for a meetup one day, you know, with maybe James and yourself and uh, mm. Tree and Shane coming down. Uh, but that's probably, although I think Tree came up with another idea. Well, I think we could go to the Trout. Well, that sounds... Uh, the Trout is uh, in Jericho, and it is the pub where Morse and Lewis would often go at the end of their day. Oh, when they right. sat out in that pub garden. Right, now the river... There is a river outside, isn't there? Yeah, that's the River Thames. Yeah, I think I've heard of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, let me ask you. So, uh, Steve asked you as far as the misses, uh, you going out with her, where would you go? How does she feel about your pipe smoking? Or is that a sensitive subject? 
she's just gotten used to it over the years. Um, I don't think she, I don't think even think it affects her anymore. <laughs> um, she doesn't like it when I smoke a cigar, that's for sure. But um, I can't say she loves it. No, but but you're allowed to smoke in certain areas of your house, aren't you? I am. Yeah, I can smoke in the sort of utility area of the kitchen. You got the kitchen utility area. I can open a window and it does it. It's very inoffensive. So but I can't and sit. There. I'm your... not like Ben the Artful Codger. I can't sit in my front chair watching telly. <laughs> and and now she has you in the dungeon smoking, right? <laughs> well, yeah, because you see now we've got all these Zoom meetups and everything, so we're yabbering all the time, and she can't put up with people yabbering about pipes. <laughs> well, moving swiftly on then, <laughs> uh, Bill, I I know you're a man of many talents, but well, other than you, pipe smoking. Or maybe even something to do with your pipe smoking. What other hobbies do you favour? What what comes to mind? Well, I uh, I'm not a fly fisherman like yourself, but I'm a, a regular coarse angler. Um, so you know, with normal bait and tackle, that sort of thing. Um, anything to do with the countryside is. Uh, you know, I'm a fan of. I used to I was born and raised on a farm, and um, so anything to do with livestock or farm knowledge, I pretty much know about. Uh, I used to do um, help out with hedge laying and all sorts of stuff. So any like country arts and things like that, you know, well, still appeals I to me. Just bring up a thing um, on our last um, ambassador. We were discussing in the program about Sir Johnny Scott, and, yeah. and you actually met him in January, didn't you? If I'm correct, or I've met it... him a few. I've met him a few times. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Johnny Scott, yeah, he's also um, he's got his own line, line of snuff. <laughs> Has he? I didn't know. Yeah, right. Sir Walter Scott's it's called, and it's uh, quite top shelf stuff, but. Um, I seen him at I think it was the one of the CLA game fairs quite a few years ago and he was chatting to somebody and of course I went running up to him and he thought I would ask about Clarissa and the countryman or something, but I brought out a tin of his snuff and I, I asked him to sign it. Oh brilliant. <laughs> he loved it. I, I do the same. I remember having a, a reel uh, that I had their um center pin and it was uh Bob James from Passion of Angling, he'd actually designed this. So since then we've worked together, but at the time he was just like, what, you know, up there on the pedestal. So I got him to sign my uh, uh, guarantee form. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we think, oh, I'm being set up here. But Bill, you also, again, just in our recent past here, a professor put up a, a film on eel catching. Yes. and you are the man that's actually done that not not his method but your own method a poacher's method if i might say <laughs> it's a poacher's method but it's not it's not it, it's fair it's fair um so what you do can i tell you <laughs> <laughs> so this is in local rivers here not in the fens but all right if you could take like a sheet of thick Imagine cotton wool in a big sheet. We used to get it, I don't know, it was like medical dressing or something, but it's thick. You take earthworms and you thread them through the cotton so they, you know, so they're kind of stuck out there. And the eels come along and they bite the cotton wool and they got these reverse hook teeth. And once they bite on, they can't get off. Wow. And you haven't hurt them. You haven't damaged them at all. They just sit there and... Usually we do throw out a sheet of that on the the evening before go down in the morning. There would usually be a couple of eels on. Well, luckily I've never been bitten by one yet. I've always been a pair of pliers holding them up. They're trying to wrap around your wrist, but I usually oh, get yeah. that in. Yeah, <laughs> they do. They wrap around your arms and they try to twist themselves off, but they're fairly harmless. 
Oh, now, yeah. Three Rivers is quite the connoisseur of ill, so maybe you could uh, cook oh, some up. Oh, oh, you have got a recipe. I, I think, is it you fr grill them, is it? I grill them, yeah, yeah. Or, you know, eat the London style jellied. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> a jelly dill, there you go. They're jelly Three deals. Rivers. <laughs> I don't think that one was actually on the menu. Everything else was on there. I probably ate it because I was that hungry. Um, Sm smoke deals are very nice as well. Well, unfortunately, if you say, which is the one taste I can still recollect. The smoke deals. It's not the gallon of fire water you were consuming with them, is it? Possibly. Yeah. <laughs> I do know that they... Uh, they came up with a solution to uh, sort of settle me down. It was called Kronenbrod, which is fundamentally Rivita dry. And it just soaked up all any poisons or antis that the, my body was trying to reject one way or another. <laughs> uh, they, they were pickled <laughs> ill by the time he finished. So. Oh, well, they were pickled, yeah. Pickled very quickly. <laughs> uh, well, excuse me, but I, I... I, I have listened to your programs. You're one of the first two people that I found when I'm sort of searching on the internet for pipes and pipe tobacco. It's yourself and talking Tommy. I'll do. And, I'll do. Yeah. Uh, but following you both all that time, uh, I've seen you get very into his, historical areas. And I'm pretty certain that you're a more than average pianist. Am I wrong or right? You know, no, you're I'm, this. I'm you're, very, you know, I am very average. You play the piano. Either you're a modest gentleman, I know I that. I do play a little bit of piano, but honestly, if you look back in my video history, I think the first video I ever put up yeah. is me practicing a piece. Yeah. Well, my son was taking piano lessons at the time and... Um, I tried to throw down a challenge to him, say, if I'll take lessons with the same teacher as you if you stick this out and everything else, and we'll both do this recital together. So there's all this recital of, uh, I think it was about eight at the time. That was about seven years ago, I would think. He was about eight at the time, and, I, and um, I was, you know, in my 40s, and I did the recital with a bunch of eight-year-olds. It was good well, fun. <laughs> well done, indeed. You had, you played, had you played the piano before that? Um, no, no, something I'd always wanted to play. Wow, that's, well, that's wonderful. <laughs> we got a howling hound in the background. Yeah, but yeah um, I love the piano. I wish I could play better. Uh, I do want to ask a question here beyond all I've got. You mentioned your son. I don't know if that's number one son or number two son. Number well, one, that is. Yeah. Number one, son, right. He's 15, is he? He's 15, yeah. yeah. And is he the one who dragged you off to Comic-Con in Birmingham last year? Yes, yes. Yeah. I am so disappointed I've not seen any photographs. So, <laughs> did it, was it boring, was it, Phil? Was it really? No, it was, it was um, amazing. There was 10,000 people there, and some of the costumes were better than you'd see in a Hollywood film. I could imagine, yeah. Well, yeah, I said, a, here's a question. Did you dress up for Comic Con? Um, <laughs> no, not this time. Not this time. Uh, the first time I did, but number one was so embarrassed that I was dressing up that he made me promise not to do it the next time. That's about to be the day. So may I ask, what did you dress up as? Or well, if, I, if I tell you that I, I, Stephen, I know, you might not even know. I wore a brown, long brown, uh, like a Mac, like Columbo would wear, a very, very long scarf oh. and a fedora hat. We are talking Doctor Who. We are talking Doctor Who, yes. Yeah. So, well, that is going to be another <laughs> question I had for you. Is Are you a Star Wars, Star Trek, or Doctor Who fan? And I think we may have just gotten the answer. I'm definitely a Doctor Who fan. I'm definitely a Star Trek fan. Star Wars is okay. Okay. <laughs> that was the Tom Baker Doctor Who, I take it, then, Phil. <sighs> yeah, I di very dimly remember John Pertwee, but I was probably four years old 
But I do remember him with his big white hair and, you know. Well, I remember William Hartnell. Brigadier. Huh? I remember William Hartnell. He was the first one. <laughs> well, I've watched them all now, but yeah. Well, I would have been a fan then. He's the one who had the bag of sweeties all the time. But swiftly moving on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the Mays now, Phil. Mrs. Sellers has done one of her special meals for you, yeah? And you've oh, so enjoyed it. It's been wonderful. Um, Sons 1 and 2 have done a wonderful uh, suite to follow. And you're just now taking your, your most favourite tobacco we mentioned earlier, and you're going to pick up a pipe so you can sit down in your comfy chair and enjoy an imbibe of that tobacco. Which pipe would you choose? Oh, which pipe? I know, I know. Well, there you go. This is well, like... I, th this is not the pipe, but it's a good pipe. Yeah. But I think I would choose my uh, Blake Marbriar's Sir Douglas pipe. Good man. Good man. On the yeah, Queen's so birthday, I wouldn't have expected it any other answer <laughs> to that. It's just the perfect pipe for the type of tobacco I like to smoke. Well, you were smoking at... Um, I can't remember if it was on... I think it was on, on one of your late, recent productions, and it does so suit you, that, that pipe. Um, he did have one still in stock, but it was a rough cut, not the smooth one. He has a, does a rough cut, doesn't he, as well? Yeah, he does a rusticated one, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Well, Phil... Hey, if you ring him up, he'll make you one. Oh, yeah. I, I, it's the one pipe I haven't got that I, that I would like to have. There's lots of pipes I haven't got, but that, that is yeah, yeah. a particular one. It's just... Um, Emotive is a is a word really, you know, it sort of sums up all that kind of era. Um, but there we go. Yeah. Um, I I I wanted to ask, you know, in your life's experience, that includes Comic Con, <laughs> is there any story that you could share with us or would like to share with us? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I said it the other. I think I said out in a private Zoom the other week, but I said I grew up on a farm and everything else, and I would, um... so dad had this funny thing about not letting me have an air rifle till he figured I had a good enough eye on the shotgun because he thought one would pollute the other. Mm. Couldn't get a, he was, I, I th think it back now, he's probably right. And I couldn't get an air rifle just wouldn't let me have one. Finally, I guess I was, I was a good enough shot. I'm not a good enough shot now, but finally let me have this air rifle. And I was out in the back field. We haven't got any livestock or anything there. And behind the farm ran all these electricity pylons, you know, going off and they have these little ceramic caps with the lines meet. You know, they have the ceramic cap. I, I presumably that's a feeds into the grid and stuff like that. And I go around just looking at it with my little air rifle and aiming for one of those caps, just thinking it would hit it and ping off and it would be a satisfying sound. And satisfying. I hit it and it wasn't certainly a satisfying sound. Oh yes. <laughs> there was an explosion. <laughs> Sparks everywhere and I can hear it's a small village, and I hear boom, boom, boom. We were out of power through the whole village for like six days. They had to get a, they had to get people from the uh, electricity board out, you know, with cranes and stuff to go up to the top of these pylons and sort it out. And I can remember running back into the house, and I had to tell Dad what I'd done because I was terrified. So dad straight away says, give me that air rifle. I thought he was going to clobber me with it, but he, he just basically hid it. It was a couple of hours later, there was this bloke, obviously, I could hear him shouting over the fields because somebody has done this on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a fault. <laughs> Oh, it was days and days before we had power. Oh, goodness. I can oh. imagine, you know, your feeling when you 
so uh, probably for a very short spell satisfying oh i was I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then the terror <laughs> hey well, at least you see... didn't miss it <laughs> yeah that's right i can see the shower of sparks and i could hear that i cracked this i cracked this thing but i didn't realize it would have all these effects on the next power line down you know, as the surge sort of traveled <laughs> wow we're probably ready for replacements anyway, Phil. Oh, so, yeah. and, you know, I don't think I've fired an air rifle since. Mm -hmm. But just coming back to shooting, I, I think with an air rifle, you're going to aim and fire. And with a shotgun, if you, you're going to take a bird, you, you're firing through the bird, if you like, rather than at it. If you fire at it, it it's gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's what your dad was probably talking about. And, so well done. Well, I think uh, when we were talking about this the other day on Zoom, I started to say, because I think somebody had mentioned as far as their experience had been that women are oftentimes better shots than men. And a part of what you were saying as far as with your dad's philosophy is what I experienced uh, back uh, in police work was that any time we would take a woman out to the range to shoot, she almost always was a better shot. And our theory was, is that I think because as, as boys growing up, we're playing with guns or we have our air rifles and you're reckless, you're not, you know, I'm meaning in your aiming, you're not as precise as you would be with a real pistol or a real rifle versus a woman when you uh, give that rifle or pistol to her and you explain the theory of, you know, sighting, lining up those sights, they're listening intently to it and then they do that. And oftentimes they'll end up being a better shot, I think, because that's the first time they've ever held a rifle. Didn't even have a play rifle or, you know, toy uh, gun. So I, I think that that's a part of that theory. So uh, it's, you know, good that your father did that. It probably made you a better shot with a shotgun than otherwise. Yeah. Well, when you said you, you, you're taking this lady up to the, the range to, to shoot, I was thinking that was a bit harsh. You were obviously coaching her. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll give you a chance. Three, two, one. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's a great start to our interview. We will come back with part two, uh, hopefully on Monday. So be on the lookout for that. And uh, we, we've, we've covered a, a number of subjects, but I, I guess the main kind of topic that we we talk about and i can't remember how much of it's in the second half versus the first portion but we do talk about fishing a, a bit uh so we're we're gonna dive into that a little bit more here in just a minute but uh what would you have to, to add after this first portion of the interview well i think it's a lot like the zoom meetings and when we sort of been talking we can cover so many subjects you know whether it be tobacco the pyramids or uh, the georgia stones uh, not you can't remember now i thought any of those got mentioned but it, it was quite diverse and any one of those subjects i think i think we could have just kept on talking yeah uh, and, and, and from my perspective really enjoying in depth different perceptions on the subject so yeah so i hope people who watch us do get en enjoyment from it well the, the man is an absolute uh, gold mine of information and intelligence and we never i think it's well he's our third isn't he and yeah. the thing is on all including uh, all three of them we've only scratched the surface you know with thabo and with wes we know how the depth Wes can go to, you know, and as, as interesting as it and absorbing of our previous two interviews have been, we could have just gone on. So I think that's the, the danger, and I'm probably waffling now. But, it, you know, it's, we get so involved, the time just fizzes by. So stick with us. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, we're going to go to old Uncle Jack here for just a minute. And uh, I have a a video clip which you had sent me really pretty early on. I think it is after our first or second Pith Helmet matinee. And uh, I 
wanted to play this video clip now because I know at one point in our interview with Phil, this uh, particular fishing rod comes up. All right. so let's watch this video clip. And I, I'm sure you'll have a bit to add uh, to really? this fishing pole. So. You sure? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. In the Camden Town murder trial at the turn of the century, a man was asked what he was doing on the street at 2.30 in the morning. And he drew himself up with pride and said to the judge, my lord, I am a roach fisher. And he was immediately accepted as a respectable man. I believe in fact that he was a lavatory attendant and that every now and then he liked a bit of fresh air and that he was setting out to be on the river Lee by dawn on a Sunday when no doubt he would have been fishing with the famous London roach pole, one of the first rods that I ever heard of. In fact, the rods I've heard of in the course of my life will tell you in parable the history of civilization. Civilization. I can go back even further perhaps in my lifetime because this is my uncle's fly rod, glad to say kept in perfect condition. It was made entirely of a wood called Greenheart, which is one of the heaviest woods in the world. And these separate pieces were experimentally planed down by a man with a circular plane, testing the action, testing the action until it was uh, perfect, or as perfect as you could make it. The ferrules were made by hand, and it's interesting they didn't trust them completely because if you look at those two little brass hooks on there, they had a reel of silk in their pocket and they used to put it round there cleat fashion in order to make sure they didn't cast, cast the rod apart when they were fly fishing. As I say, the whole thing handmade, the leather handle put on by a saddler, the brass fittings by a metal worker, and in particular, the silver mounting on the top of the handle. Mark that, because this rod, in fact, when it was made, cost 36 shillings. And I keep it in that condition in memory of my uncle, who taught me how to fish. But at the same time, they were making in London, the London roach pole, which I'm sure the lavatory attendant would have been fishing with, because all the roach fishermen on the River Lee did. And this one was made, and probably his was made, by a gentleman called Mr. Sauerbutz, who had a shop right next door to the uh, fish market uh, in London. and. The way he made it was that he took a very stiff material called Spanish reed. This rod had to be very stiff. And he had things called spade bits, which were like a flattened, sharpened teaspoon on the end of a long rod of steel. And he put them through like that, twisted them as they went. I watched him do this in his 90s. And when he, f that one, he put a larger one in and so on, and gradually he'd take out all the interior of that Spanish reed except this hard skin on the outside, and thus he would make a rod which would go together and extend very completely stiffly but very light in weight for about 20 feet, which is what these rods had to do. Because there was no reel on them, you see, so all you could have was a length of line on the end. And when you actually had to land a fish, when the whole of this was together, resting on your knee, the only way you could land it was to pull the pieces off and throw them beside you, which they did rapidly, like this, when they wanted to land a fish. So that was the London Roach Pole, a style belonging to the, particularly to the River Lee and the Thames and the capital city. Because in those days, there were different styles of rods all over the country. It's not like nowadays, where you go to any fishing tackle shop in England, 
And you will see the same things for, for everyday modern reasons. So, uh, as I say, I'm sure you're bursting uh, with, with knowledge on the, the topic of the rods. I, I will say I, I really liked the idea of the cleats to, to link the, the rods together on that fly rod because I, I, I believe I have a rod that has that but I haven't given it that much attention. I only recently acquired that rod and I haven't had a chance to use it yet. When you say you call them cleats, they're actually called ferrules. Can you see that? Yeah. Is that what you mean, where the, the different sections of the rods go in? Uh, apologies to everybody if this isn't showing up on there, we might just be able to I'll try not to put a hole in the ceiling. Um, but you can see how maybe not. Can you? No? I think it's not. Yeah, there, as long as there's something behind it. Yeah, there we go. So they're, they're called ferals. But what was uh, important, and I always, here's a little tip, kids. When I put my ferals together, I like, I, I put the, the actual guides, and uh, that's a guide where the lines go through. And I put them slightly off and then twist them into position. That way, with uh, friction, those uh, ferrules will last in there a lot longer, especially if you're on the salmon rod, where you're doing a lot of casting. And the other thing is, if it's um, a little bit loose or whatever, put a bit of candle wax on there, so that will help. I, I was going to ask you that. Do you, do you, I mean, do you commonly put wax on it? To no, no, it's only if um, you've got a bit of an issue with it. Just put a bit of candle wax, put it in, May, and maybe 45 degrees if you want, then twist it into a position where all the um, the guidelines uh, are lining up. But if I went into a rod in depth, we would be here till Christmas. But I, I will say <laughs> the first rod he, sh he showed, the cane rod, uh, with the fishing rod, he said how much it flexed. Well, these days, you can still get cane rods. I mean, America always make them um, and uh, beautiful, beautiful bits of kit. And there's some uh, bespoke makers in this country still, uh, Grays and Hardys um, do uh, cane rods. But the, the new material is carbon fiber. I mean, it's so light um, and practical. But there's three. I talk about a fly rod in particular as being a spring and you're going to cast with it. And unlike when you cast for coarse fish with a bait, it's the bait that you're going to cast out and that takes your line. With a fly rod, it's the line you're going to cast. And I will go into in depth in one of my own videos about the, um, the how you marry up the, the lines to the rods. The Association of Fishing Tackle Manufacturers of America were the first people to actually put this science uh, into place. But that through action, you'll get a, a middle action and a tip action. The tip action is very quick. And if you're a good caster, then that's it, you're brilliant. But if you make mistakes with a very fast action rod, it will be disastrous. Coming back to the middle action and maybe the through action, it's a lot more uh, forgiving as a cast. So they usually say beginners, something like a mid action. Well, I always to take my novices with a, a tip action. You know, it was cruel. But the thing is, if they were casting right, they see. If they weren't casting right, we'd know it. And I, could, I can guide them along. The, the rope pole... Um, quite heavy there, and again, carbon fiber, all now sections that they're ahead of the time with that roach pole. All the modern um, match anglers now use these poles. I'm not a coarse fisher. I do fish for coarse fish. Um, I, we tend to call it cyprinids, but I tend to fish for something called a tench um, and roach. Uh, I do enjoy those, I can catch those on the canal down here, and the, I do get the odd eel. But that's not by design, that's totally by accident. If they want to take the bait, that's not a lot I can do. Uh, but yes, it, it's fascinating to look back. And even to my, my grandfather's rod here, which my father used and I've used, I, I renovated it. So it's all varnished 
I've got uh, new guides, and well, guides which I was able to get from the help of my Steve Woolley in uh, Ashbourne in Derbyshire. He makes cane rods. He managed to uh, get some ring or uh, guides from that era because the, the original oh. ones are all um, rusted up. It is a fascinating sport, and people can say, well, you know, what you do and get a life. But I, especially with fly fishing, I just, I've got a tin of flies, I've got a net on my back. I'm in, I'm in nature, I'm in the countryside, I'm smoking my pipe. You know, what else is there today? It's just a great place to be. And I'm so blessed that Janet's a good fly fisher as well. So I don't even have to make excuses. We, we go off together. It's good. Well, I was the uh, link that he said that the roast poles go to. I think he was saying 20 feet or so. Oh, I, I wouldn't know for sure. But certainly, uh, I don't even know if there's a limit on them. But these new carbon fiber things. But he mentioned the River Lee. And going back in the day, Isaac Walton, who wrote a famous book on fishing. Um, it's old English prose in it. He, he and his friend used to go fishing on the Lee, but he also most famously fished, fly fished on the Dove in Derbyshire. And there's no way you can get a day ticket on the, that I'm aware of on the Dove. It's all um, associations and angling clubs. So you need to know somebody, even a wet line there. But uh, there's plenty of beautiful rivers around the great, well, the British Isles and Ireland. Yeah. As I was. Uh... <laughs> Ooh, that sounded rough. <laughs> As I was uh, looking through the files to, to pull up that video clip, I came across an older uh, Jack Cardgraves video, and I believe this was dated back to 69. So you're going to see he looks a bit different. <laughs> but uh, th this, was a, this was a topic I know a little bit about but not from the English side of it. So let's watch the video and, and compare maybe some of your experience with it versus my experience. I'm Jack Hargreaves and this is my dog, Bess. We live right in the country. Why don't you come and visit us? I want you to come with me today and look at a little house in the country where a friend of mine lives. Now, if this house was in London, it would probably be older than any house in the town, except perhaps the Tower of London. But in the country, it's one of hundreds of cottages that look exactly like this. So the Thatchers are here today, and they're beginning to pull off the old roof in order to re-thatch it again for what must be probably the 30th or 40th time since the little house was built. And as the Thatcher pulls off the old thatch and throws it to the ground, his son is carting it away to be burned. Now, he thinks he's a very modern young man with that long hair. But the interesting thing is that his hairdo is probably exactly the same as the Elizabethan boy who first did this job for his dad when this house was first rethatched all these hundreds of years ago. He's come to the edge now, and they pick the best straw for the edge, and they work it in very carefully because they're very proud of getting a good edge to the whole roof. Those are called spiles that he's putting in there with his hammer. There's his reed. Well, that's the comb, you see? Now he beats the thatch in it and it's covered with fine nails, like a big square comb. And he can use it when he's finished in order to comb all the least loose reed out and make it all look very neat. Now this is just two or three weeks later. And when I came along, the job was nearly finished except for that last top corner. And look at the difference. See what a beautiful job it is. And see those low windows, which prove that once upon a time, this house didn't have an upper story. He's clipped all the edges, you see, with those sheep shears. And these bits of straw, which are hanging on the creeper, won't hand there long, because this is done in springtime, and the birds will pinch all those in the next two or three days in order to build their nests. And those starlings are terribly cross, because they had a nest in that top corner in the loose thatch last year, and they can't think what's happened to their building site. It's all changed since the last time they looked at it. And this, believe it or not, was once upon a time the main road between Southampton and Salisbury. 
that cottage was actually on the main road. And this was the sort of ground over which you had to travel, even between city and city, in the days when this house was first built. People yet to love first, and he's walking along with his rod and his pipe. And what, when I was reading about this particular episode, it was shot for school children. <laughs> So you know, they would never do that today, would they? <laughs> no, I, I was 18 when that was filmed. And what I noticed as an instructor, and we're taught and I taught that you carry your rod with a point going backwards. Because if you walked into something, snap, you've gone. Or if it just dipped, it's gone. But there are times when you do carry it forwards, and he probably was going into the rough. And if he's going through thickets, that's the best time to thread your way through. Um, those, the thatched roofs, uh, I mean, ahead of the time was an insulation, you know, and, and using, um, I forget the terminology, when you, it's reusable, you know, you, it grows again some way, you can, you know, put some more thatch up there. But the life expectancy, they reckon, was about 30 to 40 years. And then they'd have to have it done again. You'd expect to, you know, budget for that. And, and that's the same today. And if you get reconstituted tiles in the UK, <clears throat> probably made out of some kind of concrete, then that, again, you should be budgeting 30 to 40 years. So no one's improved on it. Yeah. <laughs> now, that, that surprises me as far as the lifespan. And I, I, when they said how many times, I think he said 40-something times that it may have been thatched. That, oh well. I will say, having had a thatched roof in Africa. All now, right. Now in Africa, our thatched roof was with grass. Now in Belize, it was with palm leaf. But with the palm leaf roof, you would only get about seven years, and that was with seven um, seven layers of of palm leaf. But with the thatched roof in Nigeria. I would say you were probably doing good to get, if you got 10 years, you were doing really good. And, and I, a part of it, it may be that there, they're kind of um, losing the technology or the memory, how to properly do that. I don't know. That's just maybe my thought in, in regards to it. I think in, in that trade, it was father and son. And, and that's the way it carried on. I'm pretty certain if you get, I mean, in certain parts of the country, and this isn't far from um, our guest area in the Cotswolds, uh, there's a beautiful Cotswold stone on the uh, actual properties. But um, I'm sure it, it'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I seem to remember most, if not most, quite a lot anyway, high percentage of the buildings down there in the old villages uh, were thatched. Uh, well, you know, but again, how, they've probably got the resources down there with the right reeds and such to to do that. How common is it to still see that in the countryside? Countryside. Well, where we live, uh, we're not that far from. Well, sort of close to North Wales, which is renowned for uh, Blano Festinio with uh, the slate mines, and then you've got Cumbria and Coniston and the Coniston uh, slates. I mean, houses of parliament and um, cathedrals generally have the slate from, uh, I forget the name of the quarries up there now, but certainly from Cumbria, um, you know, it's renowned. So I suppose it's getting back to the old school, old days, you know, what's available? Oh, the zeal's coming up the river. Oh, well, it's rabbit time. It's pheasant time. Well, pheasants, they're an introduced species to the United Kingdom, as are... Um, Cup. I think it was his Sturson's monks brought them in originally for food and they kept them in these stew ponds. Um, yeah, I think you mentioned we might be seeing a film of someone called Chris Yates, maybe. Well, we um, may next episode. Yeah. Well, he <laughs> caught, the, at one time, he had actually caught the largest carp to that date. And wow. he's in one of these old ponds. I think it was called Redmire Pool. And again, anybody out there, if I'm talking silliness, let me know. But I think it was called Red Mire where he caught it. And that was his name to fame, I think, at that in the original days, yeah. Well, I, I will say as far as 
when uh, I was in Belize and we had the thatched hut there, again, as I say, using palm leaf, one of the questions people would always ask me when I would come back to the U.S. and talk about the mission work that I was doing in Belize, when they would see the house, and it was primarily used as a classroom, and about, I believe if, I, if I'm correct on this, I think we were 30 feet by 20 foot was the size of the building. Everybody would always say, does the roof leak? And I can guarantee you it did not leak. And I mean, it, it was a perfected process that they had. And that, that the whole roof could be thatched in probably about four hours. But you would have men from the village would all show up together and you would probably have about 15 men all working on thatching that roof. And, and it, would, it would turn out pretty quick. So, uh, you know, just local nat Yeah, and the local natural resources, proven technology. If it's not broken, don't mend it. <laughs> yep. Well, brothers and sisters, we ought to end this here. Uh, I know we've probably gone a little long today, but we uh, enjoyed our interview with Uncle Phil. Uncle Phil's seller, I'll put the link to his webpage down in the bucket below. And be sure and check his page out almost every Friday. He has a video for us and many Saturdays he'll have a little video as well. So be sure and, and check out that link, subscribe to him, subscribe to this channel. If you're not already subscribed, we'll uh, have more guests already lined up and are uh, itching for some of those interviews ourselves. I, I just think we've been blessed with the three gentlemen we've had so far and I'm, lo I'm already looking forward to next week because I have, I'm privileged to know who it is. And I can actually say we've got a gentleman as well for the week after uh, yep. already agreed to join us. So we're, we're, we are blessed in that respect, Professor. Oh, for sure. Very much so. Well, brothers and sisters, I hope you have a good weekend mm -hmm. and God bless. Yeah, please stay safe. That's what I'm talking about! <laughs>